Hi, this is Marcus Giuliano from HealthyChefDude.com, and I am back. I uh, took a little vacation, family vacation to Florida, to Orlando, actually, with the kids and Jamie. Say hi, Jamie. Hello. Took the kids down there, did some things, um, tried to stay away from the touristy stuff, uh, but of course you can't avoid that when you're in Orlando. Um, got down to Vero Beach, got to lay out on the beach for a beautiful, beautiful day out there. Back in New York, it's Friday. I'm at the restaurant. I'm with Chris Rowley. Chris, how can we introduce you? Uh, we can introduce me as a friend of yours, a former employee. I had a great time working here at this restaurant. Um, wine enthusiast, beer enthusiast, science fiction author, which is my main thing, and um, someone who writes for the local newspaper. Um, and who is actually collaborating with you. Because we're working on a big project. We're working on a project. Let's get moving on this big project. We've been working on this project that's been, oh, you know, God. every time we turn the corner, it's like more stuff we want to stick into this book. Well, uh, it just keeps mounting and mounting and mounting, and it's like, we got to cut it down. We lose focus sometimes, because there's so many things that are important to me as a, as a chef, restaurateur, health nut, environmentalist, um, food activist, and, you know, for you as well, is, so many important things. We keep finding things that keep mounting and mounting and mounting that we want just want to add. And I mean, we could really make a, a thick book here with everything we're compiling. Oh, easy! What we've got already. So we don't want to bore people. No. We want we want to engage people, have people take action in simple steps, uh, and enlighten people, educate people, and hopefully change what's happening in, in the food world, especially in restaurants. Because I've seen it. I've seen it happen. I've seen the horror stories. I was in Orlando. I, I see the crap that they serve and. They walk into some of these restaurants and they paint pictures of farms and pictures of this. Pictures of that. That's not what's happening. It's just not what's happening. It's totally misleading. It's like the chef from these big restaurants is walking out and picking from the local farm. No, it goes through a distributor truck. They buy the cheapest product. It's, it, there are some really good restaurants out there. There are some chefs who are doing the right thing. But when you walk into a chain buffet mm -hmm. and they have pictures of fresh tomatoes and how they buy this, they're not doing that. They can't. They're too big. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's very very hard. And really, you know, walk up to the salad bars, or whatever, and you just see all this junk and crap and wax tomatoes. I can go on and on and on. Yeah, me too. But yeah. you came to me with something very interesting. You sent me an email. You came to the restaurant tonight because you have cask beer nights. So you came in for a pint of real ale. Oh yeah. And you came you you came to me with some very important information that you've been doing because you do constant research. I do constant research. What is this latest thing you found about? our evolution in cooked food. What I've discovered is, uh, well, I'm just reading up on Richard Rangham, who is a paleoanthropologist at Harvard uh, University, and who had a very interesting book out about a decade ago called, called Demonic Males, which explored sexual dimorphism in human evolution, why men and women are sort of different in physical sense. Uh, his recent book is called How Cooking Made Us Human. And in a nutshell, what he's saying is, um, the shift from the very early Australopithecine type of creatures, people, to the uh, Homo habilis, Homo ergaster line, which leads to everything since, including us, uh, around two million years ago, is predicated on cooking. Because before that, everybody was chewing four, five, six, seven hours a day just to get enough calories to stay alive. And chimpanzees spend about five to six hours a day, apparently, just chewing. Now, you're not going to get very far in conquering the world if you're chewing for five to six hours a day. <laughs> but if you take a yam, now just consider how long it would take us to chew a yam, you know, a sweet potato. It would take hours. They're hard, you know. If that's, but if that's the, the sort of food that you've got available, how do you access it easily? You cook it, you can eat it in five minutes. And immediately you get a huge boost of calories and energy and all the rest of it. Now the thing that Rangham is making, which is upturning the apple cart, is up to now in that, in that zone of the paleoanthropology and the change from Australopithecine to human, it's always been the thought that it was always done with lots and lots of meat. This is not true. It now appears it was done with lots and lots of cooked vegetable food and a little bit of meat. There was meat. We know that from lots of other sources. But it wasn't... These creatures were, you know, three and a half feet tall. Our ancestors. All right, yeah, all right, at this point, 2.3 million years ago, they are three and a half feet tall and their arms are longer, they come down to their knees, their legs are short. They're not running across 
the landscape with spears in their hand. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. You know, what they're doing is, is mapping out all the food sources for them in, in, in their zone and finding everything they can possibly eat. What would be the more obvious source of food for them? It would be veg vegetable foods, and if they can cook them, they can access all these wild foods that, remember, all come with rough uh, peels and, and stuff on the outside and big seeds. Because most, most animals now in the wild stick to basically, you know, a, a pretty mono diet. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you, they eat grass, 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 or, you know, birds, you know, go after seeds, or, or you know, berries, you know. But apparently what, what this is saying is this opened up our dietary habits. Yes. Or our... Or our to other things that we normally wouldn't want to chomp and chew on, we could cook and we could eat more. Now, you also mentioned that this helped in the evolution of our brain. Yes. Or the size of our brain and, and the overall... Uh, suddenly you've got access, or relatively suddenly you've got access to lots more energy. You're cooking a yam, you can cook several yams. You can eat more food in an hour than if you're eating just raw yams and raw tough native wild vegetation type food it takes a long time to process that just you don't need the huge teeth and what do we see in the fossil record the teeth shrink and the brain size gets bigger there's much more energy for the brain and they don't need the big jaw muscles and the big jaws and the huge teeth it all shrinks down and at the same now, time I don't, I don't know if our big brains have gotten us any further <laughs> so I, I, this, this, is, this is still up in the air, and I think most people can say, well, it hasn't gotten this any further. Now, as you know, I'm, I'm a raw food. I, I love raw food. You like raw food, too. Oh, me too. You know, so when, when we start hearing, you know, cooking food and this and that, our ancestors and, you know, and the caveman diet eating meat, it, it kind of puts me up in arms a bit because, you know, I know personally that I personally live better if I eat more. The more raw I eat, the better off I am. So it's glad that I'm glad to hear to say that this guy at least... Um, this doctor or professor was saying that right. it was, that was at least saying that you know it was more vegetation as opposed to meat. Um, it's which... a combination. It's omnivorous. We're eating everything. Thing that we got to remember, and everybody needs to think about, is before this happened, you've got millions of years of our digestive system being adjusted to eating nothing pretty much except vegetation, vegetarian food. So body structure was different. Body everything was different. Big, bigger guts, yeah. bigger, bigger intestines. But all your organs, all our organs were evolved for that. That's the basis. So today, well, we don't need to chew raw food for five hours. We have blenders. We have dehydrators. We have all sorts of ways of taking high quality raw food and making this is, it accessible. This is this is a good point because being a raw foodist or being or liking raw food, I'm not hundred percent raw food, I'm not sometimes not even fifty percent. Mm -hmm. I do as much as I can when I can. When I'm away it's hard, but oh. we still will get the wheat grass shots in the morning. We still do a lot of fresh fruits and veggies when we're away, you know, raw almonds, we do all that. But now the blenders and the dehydrators allows us to go back and take two pounds of spinach. Right. What would take hours and hours to chew just right into the blender, crack open the coconut, throw the nuts in, throw the goji berries and the raw cacao, which you, you know, it's hard to eat to begin with. And, yeah. And whatever else, whatever vegetation you put in there, just blast it away and then drink all that. Yep. So I guess today's modern tools can help us go back to that sort of help, help or sort of help us go back really and take more of this raw vegetation in without having to cook. And I agree that cooking food, you know, is easier, easier, is really easier to, for everybody. As well, far as a lifestyle, as far as yeah. consuming food, you know, because people don't want to go up to a salad bar and just graze all, you know, for hours. It, it, most people don't want to do that. But getting back to these dehydrators and blenders and food processors, you can really condense all that food and may, and start that digestion process. Oh, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, raw fooders don't eat raw sweet potato. No. No, or no. potato. No, but, yeah. no, I take the sweet potatoes, slice them very thin, put some Cajun powder on them, a little bit of sea salt, and pop those in the dehydrator, and it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's perfect. That would work. Yeah. But you go back to East Africa 2 million, 300,000 years ago, thereabouts, you know, that period, 2 million years ago, you know, they didn't have the choices. They were they had, eating raw. They had the, what it was in season, what they could find. And a large part of the increase in brain size was keeping in, in the brain over a big area 
you know, where everything was and, you know, how, how they could get to those berries, those uh, tubers, these plants, right. whatever. You What's know? our time, Jay? You are almost at 10. Almost at 10. So we have to wrap it up at 10 okay. because sure. our YouTube limitations. Yeah. When they advise to be director, we'll but, but probably I mean, do a half an hour. Yeah. But the main point here is, is let, let's sum it up in the next 10, 15 seconds. And, uh, you know, it's basically about our, our ancestors and how the evolution of cooking had actually happened mm -hmm. and um, you know, what the effects came on our brain and everything. Not saying it's, it's all for the best. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> the bottom line is, eat, eat more raw food as you can. This is just a good history. It's a good topic. It's a good thing of, of where we came from. So, yep. healthychefdude.com. Follow us on Twitter. Um, look for some more blog posts. Of course, um, always good information. Um, you are what you eat. Yep.